psychedelics are important on the level of research in many different ways. For instance, they, from a philosopher's and cognitive scientist's perspective, they help us in isolating neural correlates of consciousness and of self-consciousness. They can tell us how a first-person perspective emerges, uh, under which conditions self-consciousness disintegrates. There are many technical issues about experiential realism and unrealism, how it is modulated by the brain semantic hallucinations when do people hallucinate meaning for instance like some psychiatric patients when are people unable to experience meaning like depressive patients for instance they will give us insight into these mechanisms but then there are other models of knowledge as well so there's for instance therapeutic self uh, knowledge there is it's very clear that psychedelics can catalyze, enhance, and support therapeutic processes of gaining self-knowledge. And then there is something I've always been uh, very interested in, if they could be part of a secularized spiritual practice. Uh, what is actually a relationship between, say, sustained secular meditation practice and especially lower doses, threshold doses uh, of psychedelics. So you could argue that um, if you interpret, say, spiritual practice as a process of discovery, self-exploration and gaining self-knowledge as well, that's another dimension in, wh in which they can support us in gaining more knowledge. Mm -hmm. I don't know, I think since the early uh, 60s, uh, 70s, a lot of things have changed. My intuition is there's actually more LSD, for instance, being taken than in 1968 now, but it's taken quietly in protected context. It's completely invisible, but it has been become part of a subculture practice, just like ayahuasca and, and and uh, other uh, substance combinations. So it is there all the time and it has been transformed. But some damage has been done um, through decades of denial and not finding a cultural context to integrate these substances. We now have a situation, for instance, where the Chinese mafia produces masses of synthetic cannabinoids and imports them for the rich children in Europe and America. We have uh, a situation like 20 years ago there were about 12 to 15 illegal molecules that um, presented a problem for police and psychiatry. In 2016 it was the first time that there were more than 100 new psychoactive molecules confiscated for the first time in Europe. I don't know the exact number, but I think we now have something like 620 molecules, uh, new research chemicals, variations of molecules. And the damage done by this uh, is of course a result of decades of denial. If we had thought about this earlier and in a productive way, we would now not have many illegal labs, organized crime, and a lot of damage that is invisible to statistics. So the question is what psychedelic renaissance means. There are a lot of, many more molecules are around. There are established use patterns, but we don't yet know how productive that is and how much damage it really does. Because um, the psychiatric emergency, the damage done to society is basically invisible. And. Um, the question is if we manage now to create a new cultural context because the situation is basically out of control right now. Oh, that is a very long story. <laughs> when I studied philosophy in the late 70s in Frankfurt, the situation was that many philosophy students would just live off very strong black tobacco, Schwarzer Krause, and coffee. They had to look very unhealthy and wear black clothes. 
and there were maybe 800 students. Most of them were completely crazy, but they were very deeply interested in philosophy. It was a fashionable subject, they were reading a lot. Now, as a professor of philosophy who has taught in eight different universities in Germany, uh, for me, teaching was always the most nicest part of the job. Um, it's not anymore, about five years ago. And now I have these uh, kids who are dissociated all the time because they're in their mobile phones. They will not read books anymore. They are blasé. They are not really interested. Not 10% of the systematic interest is there that was there in philosophy students 1978. So I have to teach these uh, Facebook kiddies uh, who only have this ask questions like does this have something to do with Matrix and uh, who will not read books and only say 2 to 8 percent have a deep interest in philosophy and would be still be able to read books. So I think massive media consumption and acquired attention deficit disorders have done a lot to philosophy students as well and for the few that are really interested it's difficult uh, if they are in large groups that are not interested of course i don't know how many of them take uh, psychedelics we've done some research uh, in, on cognitive enhancers and the interesting result was that in America, a lot of students take cognitive enhancers like Adderall, Modafinil, um, Ritalin, and so forth. And German students are pretty old-fashioned. They do caffeine tablets. And then you have a very small margin of 1% to 2% if you ask them in its questionnaires. And they know every drug. They haven't only done cognitive enhancers, but also psilocybin and, and everything. But I think the large majority uh, is basically in, uh, on an alcohol and caffeine level. That is a really deep problem, is that what we scientifically know about psychedelics is in such a dissonance or disharmony with cultural practice. And um, I think it would be ethical it is an ethical obligation to minimize harm and risk and to optimize the overall risk-benefit ratio in society. Um, that's an ethical obligation and science could help with it. But we also have to be realist um, that society is not really interested in Bewusstseinskultur or an ethical consensus. So maybe we have to just go the way by showing how damage control and harm reduction could be done by a slow process of enculturation, not legalization, but by slowly creating a new cultural context and uh, just show that everybody will benefit from it and the number of you know, emergencies and also the financial damage to the health system can be minimized. And that's probably uh, the way to go. Well, uh, a driving force, at least I think as a philosopher, is mortality denial. And there's even for many, not only for organized religion, but for many cultural practices, there's actually um, research on this. There's a psychological theory that's called terror management theory. And that theory has many experiments that show if you increase mortality salient information in a scene, people become more committed to their ideological framework by which they live and deny their own mortality. So my experience in walking through this was that there was suddenly a lot of mortality salient information. So the empirical prediction would be that in this building, Buddhists become stronger Buddhists and Catholics become more pious Catholics and communists become more hardcore communists if they see uh, these objects around them. That's actually an empirical um, prediction. So it will not really lead <laughs> 
to de ideological um, to a, to a weakening of ideological assumptions to be uh, confronted with this. But as we all know, a core part of the psychedelic experience is to confront your own mortality. I don't go to psychedelic conferences anymore for many years because basically they don't meet my academic standards. I've been disappointed too many times and this was just great. Uh, there was a very high degree of interdisciplinarity. It was clear that there was fresh ongoing research and practically every talk I've listened to was really substantial and of a high academic quality. So I'm coming away from this conference uh, with the feeling that there's really something new and fresh moving, perhaps.